Hello and welcome to another video and podcast from Fantasy Football Scout. My name is Tom and today I'm joined by a very special guest, uh, Fantasy Football Scout Pro Pundit and one third of the brilliant FPLY podcast. Uh, I'm joined by Pras. Pras, how are you doing? I'm good, uh, Tom. Good to chat with you. First time we're podding together. Uh, you tell me, how are you doing? Yeah, very well. Excited. Lots of tinkering. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so in this video, we're going to do something slightly different uh, to all the team reveals we've done so far and we're going to actually chat a little bit about chip strategy and more specifically about the wildcard chip because I know Praz you've been writing on site and doing your own content um, about the wildcard and how it's affecting your your game week one team so do you want to quickly sort of maybe introduce why you think it's really important to consider it and you know sort of look in depth at it early doors yeah so I think I mean first thing to say is uh the changes that FPL have made this year have been really brilliant. So I think the fact that uh, you know you can now wildcard and carry your tri transfers through the wildcard, that makes the wildcard a little bit weaker. Like we used to think, okay, let's have this window, this magical window, like game week eight last season or 10, and you can basically just dead end your team towards it and the new wildcard. Now you don't need to dead end because you can just carry your transfers through the wildcard. So the idea is that it's it started to... Th you know, it's, it, it's it's for me brought the wild card a little bit earlier than we would typically do, because usually at the beginning of the season we get a lot of information, but we tend to ignore it because we say, okay, I'll be wild carding in a certain week. But we also keep using transfers to to basically react to that. This season, I think there'll be a temptation to say, I'm going to hold off on my transfers. I'm going to carry these three, four transfers and then make it, you know, make this big move. But you could also equally wild card early. So I think the the strategy that I feel will be very, very popular is either a, a game week four wildcard, which is the very early wildcard, which is on the back of only three game weeks, or a game week six wildcard, which would be on the back of five game weeks. And the game week six wildcard appeals a little bit more in terms of fixtures because in game week five, Man City play Arsenal. So you want to avoid those guys and then get them all in your game week six wildcard. And also for game week six in the first five game weeks, Liverpool and and Newcastle have really good fixtures, then you can sort of let go. So there's a natural swing in game week six anyway, which feels early, which I think will be popular in terms of in terms of a wildcard window. So that's that's my early thoughts in terms of it I've I find it I will find it very surprising if a lot of people hold on beyond game week six. I think there'll be people who are either ultra patient or are off to an, an amazing start and they just feel like they've hit it out of the park. There's no need to wildcard. There will be some like that, but I think the majority will wildcard four or six. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so yeah, so in this video, we will look at the tickers for the first three weeks and the first five weeks, and then we'll bring up two different teams uh, from Pras, uh, his two drafts, uh, a game week four wildcard and a game week six. Um, so we'll kick off with the first five fixture ticker, which is, yep. of course, a Fantasy Football Scout members tool, uh, fully customizable, interactive, uh, sortable by difficulty as well. Um, so, yeah, on the screen for the podcast listeners, we've got the ticker for the first five weeks. Uh, at the top is Fulham, then Liverpool, Newcastle, Palace and Man United. Um, and then at the bottom, we've got Brentford, Arsenal, Wolves, West Ham and Spurs with City, Chelsea, Everton, Villa sort of hanging in the middle. Um so, Pras, I guess, first of all, what sort of stands out for the first five, obviously, with Fulham top? Yeah, so I think what stands out to me is actually the bottom first, which is basically, as you can see, that Arsenal don't have the best first five with away to Villa, away to Spurs and away to Man City. So when, when we say Arsenal had amazing defensive numbers last season, no matter how amazing, away these three away games are tough, right? You don't expect clean sheets. So you're basically saying if you're going for Arsenal defenders, the two games are Wolves at home and Brighton at home, which are good, but you could look to maybe swerve away from them if you're looking at a game week six wildcard. So you could. Uh, instead, you can look at teams like Liverpool, now, Liverpool come with their own problems. And I'll talk about Liverpool as we're talking about the next wildcard window, which will be game week four. But at the moment, let's assume by game week one, we have good enough information on Liverpool on how attacking or pivotal Mo Salah is, uh, you know, wh whether Trent is inverting or is in attacking 
I think he'll do that anyway. But you know, to what extent? What is Trent's role? What is Robertson's role? You know, people are interested in Soboslai, uh, Gakpo. There's so many exciting picks from Liverpool. This fixture run tells you that you should attack them, especially if you have a wild card window in game week six. I think Newcastle are another one, very popular team on on you know around. If when you see people's drafts, Isak is pretty much with in any everyone's team. Gordon at seven point five also feels like good value. Uh, and then you can get a defender, you can pair them up with a burn if he's still nailed or a Livramento if Trippier leaves. So it feels like there's like five or six places for Liverpool and Newcastle. As you can see, there's reason to it. Uh, then you can pair that with a, a Muniz who's excellent value at six million as a, as a cheap striker. You've got Crystal Palace, you know, a lot of people are looking at Eze, looking at Munoz, looking at Henderson as their keeper. So you can see where I'm going with this. I think you can look at the ticker and that has played heavily into people's minds which naturally lends itself to a game week six wildcard because all these teams, effectively after after this five weeks, Newcastle go into place Man City. Liverpool have three away games in four after this game week. Um, Crystal Palace have a decent run, but basically where you can see where I'm going with this, where Liverpool and Newcastle actually tail off and then Arsenal become much better. They have two home games after this. Man City have a wonderful run. Just after five, they play Newcastle away. But after that, they have a great run for the foreseeable future. So these are the things that play into my mind in terms of going for certain teams. But the other thing to talk about also is big hitters, right? I mean, this season, the pricing has been done really well. Another kudos to official FPL. And I think where I have landed personally is it's going to be either Haaland or it's going to be either Salah. Because I just feel there's a, a lot of value in the Son, Saka price range or even Palmer price range that if you go Haaland and uh, Salah, then you're actually going to miss out on that category and you're going to miss out on some great defenders like a Guardiol or a Trent or a third defender like a Robertson or a Saliba. So I feel like it'll be one of the two that I will go with. And if you're looking at a game week six wildcard, I think where it sort of takes you is... Probably Salah over Holland, which feels very scary. But if you look at Salah's fixtures, I mean, you have home to Nottingham Forest, home to Bournemouth, home to Brentford, all captainable. Away to Ipswich, also captainable. Only game week three could be a potential issue with him. He's away to Man United. You could argue even that is fine. So it feels like he's the better pick if you're going for a game week six wildcard. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was going to ask you briefly about Man City because they are quite low on the ticker, but... You know, they drew 4-4 at Stamford Bridge last year. They got Ipswich in game week two and West Ham and Brentford. So, you know, I think maybe that first fixture slightly misleading, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think so. I think, uh, look, I think if Haaland wasn't 15 minutes, there's always a trade-off, right? So, you know, I can say if I was going for Haaland and I'm also going for Salah, then I'd probably then say I don't need Salah. Because ultimately, you have to think about the trade-off. If I'm happy with Man City's fixtures and I'm happy to captain Haaland for the first four game weeks, let's say, um, then do I need Salah? Because then I could downgrade Salah to a Saka or a Son, save 2.5 million, upgrade my third defender to a Trent from 4.5, that's 2.5 up to Trent. I'd rather do that then. So basically, that's where I'm... That's where I keep thinking where it's going to be one or the other to make a more balanced team that can withstand injuries or anything that I foresee in the first three, four game weeks because I really don't want to make transfers due to injuries during a time where I can just carry them wildcard and then fix all my issues and then carry two, three transfers out of the wildcard, which feels like a very powerful position to be in. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll bring up your team now, uh, the first draft for a wildcard game week six. Um, yeah. And I'll read it out in a second for the podcast. But just to touch on what you said there about um, not wanting to make a transfer due to injury, does that sort of explain why you, both your drafts are really strong? Um, you've got 14 playing, no, 13, sorry, playing outfield players. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the reason where um, I want to have a team where I'm, you know, I can see a lot of Barcos and Howard Bellises and I, I see value there as well. But I'm just hesitant to use transfers to fix you know, let's say if you have two 4.0 defenders and your one of your defenders gets injured, one of your three defenders that you're going to be playing, I think that immediately says, okay, I need to use a transfer to fix this. It's annoying. I'm trying to avoid that. Now, I, I'm not saying I, I wouldn't end up with a cheaper bench. I could, and you'll see in my second draft, the shorter your wildcard horizon, the cheaper the bench can be because you can just, you know, if you get an injury in game week two, fine. Game week three, you just play who you can and then, and then wildcard. When you're, when you're going longer, and I think game week six is longer, 
then you want to avoid those things. So that's the, at least the thinking for now, and especially because I'm going for a one premium only, I can afford that. Um, and that's something that I do in the past couple of seasons. I think that's something that I've learned a little better. I was also of the old school sort of thought process earlier where you want to put all your money on your pitch. But I think thinking about rotations of certain players, thinking about having some insurance for injuries, it's just made me at least look at a very good first bench and possibly a decent second bench. Yeah, very understandable. Um, so yeah, I'll read out your game week six wildcard um, first draft for the podcast. Uh, so in goal, you've got Dean Henderson and Bentley, the 4.0 keeper. <clears throat> um, Trent, Gavardiol, Byrne, Robertson and Concert in defence. Uh, with Nkunku, Eze, Gordon, Saka and Salah in the midfield. And then up front, you've got Moniz of Fulham, Armstrong of Southampton and Isak, as you mentioned earlier, um, of Newcastle. So I guess the the sort of standout there is the triple Liverpool. Uh, we showed the ticker, they're, they're second for the first five, so they've got an incredible start. Um, but yeah, double defence, I haven't seen that in many teams, especially Robertson. Yeah, look, I mean, Robertson, it'll come down to his injury. I mean, in, in the Euros, he picked up an injury, but I think the last that Arnis Lott said was he'll be back, maybe even for the US tour. So that's actually sooner than when we'll see Trent, because... Uh, you know, people like people who went far in the tournament are actually going to be back even later. So at the moment, this is the Liverpool triple up that makes sense to me. Robertson could become Sabosli and I could go for a Saliba. But I am keen to triple up on Liverpool because of the fixtures that I said, keeping in mind wildcard six. So that's basically I need to reiterate because you'll see in my wildcard four, there's actually not a single Liverpool in it. So this is the thinking that if they're top of the ticker for, for the first five game weeks, then we need to attack on Liverpool. And that means Salah over Haaland. And that means a Liverpool triple up. It also means a Newcastle triple up, which you can see here. The three guys that talked about, Isak, Gordon and Burn. Um, a couple of people from Crystal Palace, we saw they were high up in the ticker as well. Muniz was top of the ticker. That's basically the backbone of the team. Yeah, I mean, how do you see Liverpool shaking out in pre-season? Do you think there's potential for a, a Gakpo, uh, a Diaz or maybe even a Darwin? I don't know how you feel about Darwin, but I mean, I've heard people saying Gakpo, especially with the Dutch connection there uh, with the manager and obviously had a great Euros as well. Uh, I'm open to all possibilities for Liverpool. I think uh, both upside and downside. When it's a new manager, I mean... Uh, you know, you may have seen it with Mourinho, although Chelsea still continue to be successful with new managers coming in. I think Man United really felt it when there's a when a marquee manager, the guy who's brought you success leaves. It's just so hard to replicate. It's not so easy, easier said than done. Uh, but Liverpool have a good structure in place, unlike Man United, who suffered because, you know, it was basically broken at the top. So I do think slot could do well still. So I do think there's upside here. And these are the kinds of teams where you find hidden gems which everyone ends up on in three or four weeks I think Akpo could easily be one of them I think Darwin could easily be one we need to be open-minded on, on Darwin again Jota could be that Soboslai could be that so the problem with Liverpool is simply that these players aren't apart from Soboslai Salah I can't think of a single player that is actually fit and playing not rested for the US trip yeah, definitely. Um, I've got to, You mentioned Man United briefly there. Um, I got to ask because they were. I think they were fifth on the ticker uh, for the first five, and you haven't got any of their players. Do you? Obviously, it's quite hard to know where to go in the attack, but they potentially have a four and a half defender uh, to consider. I just don't see a clean sheet apart from the first game. Um, unfortunately, I mean the defensive data was terrible. It's just a team that you wait and watch. I mean, Rashford could be tremendous value. Rashford is like this yo-yo player that is priced, underpriced. He does really well. Then is overpriced, does really badly. So maybe this is the season he's again underpriced and, and does very well. I mean, they, he's what, 7 million? It's just incredible uh, for Rashford, for what he's capable of. Uh, I think even Bruno is good value. I've seen Bruno in a few drafts at eight, eight and a half, eight and a half years. Um but I just don't think defensively you need to go there. There's other good picks for four and a half, like a cons uh, or a point that I have in my draft at the moment. There's also Blanco, you can go for a full defender. There's just some upside with the rotation. I don't think Man United has that, so I'm happy to avoid for now. It just makes it an easier watch for me as well, <laughs> as yeah, a fan. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I wanted to also touch on the sort of triangle that you've got in defensive midfield with Gavardi, Saka, and Nkunku. Um, Obviously, that could potentially be Foden and Saliba, although the quotes we've seen this week on Foden are not too promising. Um, 
but yeah, and then obviously Nkunku over Palmer as well. You know, it could be Palmer and, you know, maybe a Martinelli or something if that comes good. So, yeah, talk to me about sort of Gavardiol and Saka because we saw that um, you weren't too hot on Arsenal's fixtures as well. Yeah, I, look, I think we still know that Arsenal have the second best team in the league based on last two years' data uh, and what we've seen. So, I think it's a case of, I feel odd not... There's two home games in the first three. I just feel you're being too passive if you completely avoid Arsenal. I think Odegaard at 8.5 is a good pick. Um, but I think if I look at players in isolation, and we're like between, for five weeks between Saka, Palmer, um, Son and Foden, Foden for the reasons you mentioned, he may not be ready for game week one, so you don't need to go there. Um, and and then for between Saka and Son, it's closer. I think Palmer for 0. 0.5 more, Again, under Maresca, you tell me, but I just feel like it's a little bit of you can wait. You can wait, uh, you know, if they play Man City anyway in game week one. And then you all, there's also the Inkunku factor, right? I mean, he's playing, what, number eight, number 10 in a hybrid role. But it's a moving moving target in terms of what Chelsea is. You could sign Osimhen tomorrow and then it completely changes. He takes Pens away from Palmer. You know, you, you know so it's, it's basically a, a setup in flux. It's a new manager. Unlike Liverpool, there's also new players within that setup. So it's not, you know, Liverpool have the same players essentially, but a new manager. In Chelsea, it's a new manager and new players. We'll see. Maybe Dewsbury Hall is the guy to pick from Chelsea. So that's so that's why Palmer has been a little bit avoided. I could change Saka to Son if I wanted to, but I don't like Spurs' fixtures in three and four. And so you'll see in my next draft if I when I look at a game week four wildcard, I'm much happier going for Son because his first two fixtures are really, really good. Yeah. And then, yeah, just to finish up on this draft, um, you've sort of got Muniz and Armstrong there. So talk to me a little bit about sort of how you'd rotate those two perhaps. And then... so I think Muniz would be almost a perma play uh, because they've got good fixtures in all the, fix uh, all the first five weeks. Armstrong would be first bench and he would stay there. Uh, because the first week when Nkunku has Man City, Armstrong also is away to Newcastle. So I think I'd rather just play Nkunku in that case. So Armstrong is just there. Because after the first week, Armstrong's fixtures are amazing. Let's say there's an injury to a Gordon, right? In game week three. I'll just leave him. I'll just play Armstrong. So that's the thinking with Armstrong. Having a good bench option. Having a, a good second, third bench for, for a defender, that's just thinking of rotation. I think Burn rotates really well with Konza. If I need to play them, I can play them. In fact, in game week one here, I would bench both in Kunku and Armstrong and probably play four defenders because Robertson, Guardiol, Trent and Burn are all playable. Uh, so it's a little bit of a rotation that I'm trying to get going more for longevity of the squad more than anything else. Yeah. And then quickly on captaincy, what, how do you see that one? Uh, Isak versus Salah. We've had a bit of love for Isak on this this team reveal series, but I feel like you might be saying Salah. I, I think I think I'm open to Salah. If I, if I, I see a couple of things from Salah, that he's in the central. You know, in the last game it was basically he played hardly any defensive boss as the two number tens, and Salah was you know, he did create the assist for the the preseason game. I want to see a couple of goals. I want to see him being that number 10 or potentially, you know, when the, when he plays the two wide forwards, he needs to be one of the wide forwards. I just want to see that. And I think he's clearly clearly a great pick. It's the lunchtime kickoff, which, which puts people off in terms of, you know, first game of the season, a way to a promoted team. I could be tempted to an, uh, towards an Isak, but I think at the moment I would say Salah is, is, would be my captain if it was tomorrow. Yeah, fair enough. And then on the kickoff time as well, you've got that Friday night cover in Maniz as well, which I'm sort of working out how to get in because I'm not sure I want to. I think I need someone to watch on the first day, but yeah. Muniz Problem is, is he good. plays my team. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I don't know how I'll be watching that. I don't, because it's Man United playing Friday evening, actually, I'm not really worried about that one. But probably I'd want a Liverpool because then you're like, people are already on like 12 points and you haven't yeah. started the season. Yeah, definitely. Um, Cool. So we'll move on to the uh, first three fixture ticker. So this would be obviously what you would be considering if you are set on a game week four wild card, um, which we'll bring up a team for in a minute. But the difference here is Forest leap to the top. Uh, they've got Bournemouth, Southampton and Wolves in the first three. So really, really good there. And then Fulham, Newcastle, Liverpool are, are still up there. Bournemouth rise up a bit and Man City rise up a bit as well uh, with that Ipswich fixture taking on a bit more significance um, and then at the bottom Brighton, West Ham, Ipswich not really players you're considering anyway but an yeah. Arsenal are sort of mid-table as well as you said with their two uh, good home games against Wolves and Brighton so 
So exactly. yeah, what about these? Cha- what about the sort of changes? Forest come into the equation quite a bit. <clears throat> forest definitely come into the equation, and uh, you'll see my draft that there is quite a bit of forest look in there. But it's only for two, three weeks, so um, you know it makes sense to go heavier on forest. I think in this one, even though Liverpool are uh, you know up there um, as what the fourth best, I think you you can now make a case that you can probably go Haaland over, uh, over Salah because, look, they're, they're fairly close in terms of fixtures for the first three. Now, clearly, Ipswich away is better than Chelsea away. But then after that, Ipswich home is way better than Brentford at home. And then West Ham away is arguably better than Man United away. So this is why I think if you're going for a Game Week 3 wildcard, the first thing is Haaland could be in above Salah. And then the second thing is, as you mentioned, Arsenal are now way above where where we saw them because this is obviously avoiding the two difficult games which which uh, which are following game week 3 which is basically away to spurs and away to man city so you could basically maximize your arsenal here as well at the expense of a liverpool so in in a, in short basically where i had robertson and trent you could have saliba and you could you could have guardiola and maybe another arsenal defender you can basically go a lot heavier on Arsenal and Man City, which feels right, right? I mean, you, those are the two good teams yeah. that that you want to target going in. So it feels like if you go for this wildcard strategy, you're picking the teams where you know what you get. You, you know what you get with Man City. You know what you get with Arsenal. You're adding a little bit of Forest, which is also still under the same manager. So it's not too different. Because you still have, you know, a couple of players for home. So it feels to me like it is something where you can go. And Crystal Palace, by the way, another thing to mention is these first three aren't now the best. Even though in the previous ticker, Crystal Palace looked like the team to target. I think here, what you can say is, I'm going to watch Crystal Palace for three weeks. Away to Brentford, not great. Away to Chelsea, not great. Home to West Ham, okay, nice fixture. But I can watch them. And then I can decide if I need to have a Munoz, if I need to have an Eze. If Eze is, is he even staying, um, is Kamada the guy to pick? So I think that also lends itself to a good, um, good pickup. And then you can avoid Aston Villa and Chelsea and the guys at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that Man City Chelsea game is causing people a lot of headaches. Um, but if we defend like we did against Celtic the other night, then I'm not sure Haaland will have too much trouble. Um, but yeah, but on the flip side, they could yeah. be without Rodri and Foden. So you know Correct. that game is really it's, it looks quite interesting at least for a couple of weeks out. But and then yeah, Palace as you say, what do you think about them with Elise going? Obviously, Eze there's rumours, Gehi there's rumours, Mateta was linked to Aston Villa today. So do you, do you sort of see them as the form team from last season or do you is your mind back open to them being a little bit worse? I mean, I think if you remove transfer speculation, I'm very high on them. But this is where the Game Week 4 wildcard works really well because once you see them and the transfer window is shut and they, they are over their two cup tougher games, then they have a very good run. So then you can actually get the real fixtures that you want, which is in Game Week 4, they play Leicester at home. In Game Week 5, they play Man United at home. Last last year, they battered Man United at home. So I'm not saying the same thing happens, but the home games are the ones you want to target. Yeah, and then just before we come to a draft, we haven't really talked about the promoted teams yet. Um, Ipswich are at the bottom of the ticker, so maybe not them, but Leicester start with home against Spurs, not too bad offensively, and then a trip to Fulham. You sort of Are you watching and waiting on the promoted guys? Yeah, I think uh, it's one of those times where there isn't an obvious team, right? Last season when, when Burnley and Luton were up there, you just knew that these are the teams to target. I think Leicester, good outfit, right? A lot of these players played Premier League football for them. Um, I think very high on McKenna and Ipswich, and, and you, you know we don't know what we get with them. Um, so we can wait and see where they get to and then and then sort of take a decision on are we going to target these teams or are there others that fall down? Southampton, maybe you can argue that that's a targetable fixture, but then most people are, you know, are on triple triple Newcastle in in and then I'm also loading up on Nottingham Forest here. It's all to target Southampton, basically. Yeah. Uh, cool. So I'll now bring up the game week four wildcard uh, first draft. So this is essentially just a free hit team for the first three weeks. Um, exactly. So in goal, Prowse has gone for Cells of Forest with Bentley, the backup uh, four. Um, Saliba, Gavardio, Byrne, Murillo and Harwood Bellis. So there's a four million defender in there now. Um, Odegaard in midfield with Nkunku, Brennan Johnson, hudson Adoy, and Saka. Uh, and then up front, Muniz and Isak are still there, but they've been joined by Haaland, um, essentially instead of Salah, as Pras was saying. So I guess the sort of changes here, there's a little bit, well, there's triple Arsenal uh, for a start and triple Forest, and the Liverpool 
has vanished. So yeah, zero. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this to, is you yeah. know, people ask me uh, why do you anchor, and I always play this way. And, and people say why do you anchor to a wildcard week? This is the answer, because just by shifting your wildcard window by two weeks, there's so many different players that I start with, and neither of the teams are bad, right? Neither of the teams are bad players, uh, but it's just about how do you strategize what weeks you want to target, and so. This wildcard window is 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 appealing because you can get Saka, Odegaard, Saliba, home to Wolves, fantastic fixture, right? You you start off really strong. Uh, you get Bournemouth at home for three of the Forest guys, double Forest defense. Now you don't need to play Murillo every week because I've got three other good defenders. You could even bench Murillo first week if you really wanted to. But the idea here is that you can potentially target the good fixtures, and you have you know teams that you can do that with. Uh, you know, you'll have Guardiola and Haaland for home to it, it switch in game week two. Um, you know, the Forest guys will play Southampton in game week two. Um, Arsenal have a trickier fixture in against Villa, so in this case, I would probably bench a Saliba if uh, you know if if that's the thing that that works out. But otherwise, playing one Arsenal defender is never never too bad. Unkunku is still there. I am high on your boy Unkunku, so he's there in both drafts. Um, Isak is still there. So and Johnson, I think Brennan Johnson is another one that uh, I, I talked about. The good fixtures for Spurs, Leicester away, and then um, who do they play after that? Um, uh, Everton at home. So good two out of three fixtures that you can target. So this is the thinking with this with the three week free hit, like you called it, and I think that's exactly what I would try, I would call this because I would not look to make any transfers here. In fact, in this draft, the reason why I've gone for a stronger fourth defender um, and possibly good eight attackers is because even if there's an injury to a Brennan Johnson or a Dan Byrne or even a Saliba after first game week, I'll just leave it and then I'll just wildcard in game week four. Uh, so then you then you carry two free transfers into your wildcard. You take all the new information that you get in on Liverpool, on Crystal Palace, on Leicester, um, all the other teams and you already know what you have with Man City and, and Arsenal. It will help me understand who the key enablers are. Is it Kamada? Is it Hudson Odoi? Is it somebody else? And then I can make a more informed decision on my way, you know, game week four onwards wildcard team. And the fixture swing that we discussed in the game week six um, part, that I would use with my free transfers because I'd be sitting on hopefully three or four free transfers so I can transition out my my, you know, I would get Liverpool players in my wildcard four because they have good fixtures. I would transition them and bring back Arsenal guys by game week six. That would be the rough play that you would you would try to do with this. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. This is really making me think because there's loads of positives. The sense that you get a free hit to start essentially for three weeks. You don't have to make transfers, and then you know you're wildcarding, and then you're coming out with three or four free transfers. So yeah, there's a lot to like, and the price points as well. You know, you, you're covering off premium midfielder, premium defender, Haaland. Um, yeah, this is really, really good, great content, really good, in, <laughs> really interesting. Um, but yeah, d- uh, someone who's been in both drafts, Cavardi, I'll talk to me a little bit about him because he he hasn't moved despite not being too high on City's fixtures uh, for the the longer term draft. I mean, I just uh, I didn't own the guy last year when he was doing all the things he was doing at the back end of last year. Uh, I think he feels like a Cancelo type pick uh, back in the days when uh, you know you get attacking threat and one of the best defenses uh, in the league. So if Arsenal had you know he's if if Ben White was six six million as well, I think he'd be in a lot of drafts. So you get a similar thing with attacking potential, great team. Um, I just think he's a good pick and. Even though people may not want him early doors or may have doubts about him, is he going to play? Is Ake going to play? Or is he going to be as attacking if Grealish is playing on the left? Once he plays in that position in the community shield against Man United, I think a lot of people will just say, look, I can't go through this again. Yeah, if he if he scores a goal, that's, you know, I'm already off to a really bad start. Six million is terrific value. I mean, all defenders, I think, are great value, especially the premium ones. I think one thing, one other thing I didn't talk about is this season, because of the bonus points change, again, a good change made by FPL. Uh, but I think the negative of that change is it doesn't reward defenders at all. Because what it's done is it has a double effect on defenders. The defenders now suffer because if they concede a goal, they get negative BPS. But also the attackers will do better because every time an attacker has a shot on goal, an attacker is fouled, they get positive BPS. So you're actually not only your baseline has dropped and the attacker's baseline has increased. So it's a double effect. So if you're going to pick, you know, defenders from bad teams or okay teams, 
what are you expecting just clean sheet because bonuses are not coming i mean this is going to be very hard to win a bonus so i think that paying that little bit extra for a guardiola for a trend would really work because you know you would get that attacking output you would get a clean higher clean sheet potential and bonuses anyway out of the equation so this is why i keep coming back to in this draft for example <clears throat> people would downgrade a guardiola to a 4.5 defender a saliba to a 4 million defender even and you can take saka up to sala but why do you do that why would you want to do that uh, when you know saka can possibly match a sala and guardiola will definitely beat a 4.5 million defender so that's basically the thinking with one premium as well as a premium defense for now yeah yeah definitely i mean Gav- yeah guardiola's a great pick and as you said at the end of last season he obviously i think was it three goals and two assists i think at the end um yeah but yeah um so you in the midfield he's sort of gone with johnson and hudson adoy and you you haven't got gordon anymore which feels like maybe a little bit of a necessary downgrade i mean i it could be gordon instead of johnson i just thought spurs is is there to attack if you look at the first three fixtures only for newcastle if you're really breaking it down they've got two away games so they've got bournemouth no actually they've got two a home game against spurs uh, a home game against southampton and a way to bournemouth i mean actually when i look at that i probably will switch johnson to a to um to your um, whatever his name is gordon, gordon. Yeah. and i'll have to find a million um so i'll have to work that out but i think uh, this draft was simply so that i could afford an odegaard instead of a, a a gordon and so i had to find that million to upgrade him and i still wanted to keep a saka so it, you had to make a sacrifice somewhere i think if i can find another 5.5 gem and hudson odoi can or an ngunku can become uh, gordon so it's an option but you can't have them all yeah and then on liverpool have you i'll bring it back up the ticker quickly just so we can sort of see liverpool they've they're still fourth with ipswich brentford and man united who you know you were talking about their defensive record earlier um have you, are you ruling out liverpool for that for this short term draft or is it sort of just a case that arsenal are better yeah it's a case that arsenal are better and then i prefer man city which is as well which when i compare salah to haland I just think Man City's first three are better than Liverpool's first three. If you go five weeks, Liverpool are easily better because they've got two home games after this. Yeah, yeah. And then just sort of a final question, sort of a more a holistic question in the sense you've you've spoken a lot about sort of World Cup windows and then a bulk of free transfers as well, which which sort of tells me that you're not going to be afraid to swap around the premium assets this year. You sort of see that as being the key to success. You know, swapping Haaland and Salah, swapping you know Saka and um, you know maybe palmer or someone like that and son as well you've mentioned i think it's a sign of pressing that um, that people most people will look to do that i think you cannot just say i've got 0.2 tied up in saka and i'm not going to move him to palmer even though palmer has five good fixtures you'll have to be open between haland and sala to switch around you'll have to be open between saka son Palmer Foden to switch around possibly have more even in defenders i think a lot of people will end up post wild card on at least one arsenal defender but be- af- apart from that you can switch around between a guardiola and a second arsenal defender and a trend or even go to go down and downgrade so i think nobody feels a lock and that's a good thing yeah for sure i mean i think the pricing's great and you know we've seen lots of variation in this team reveal series you know no haland haland you've obviously got a draft without haland as well which is good and sort of makes vindicates his price um but yeah so thank you very much praz that's lots and lots of interesting stuff there especially with chips because i haven't given chips My too pleasure. much thought but i i definitely will be and that game week 4 wild card looks really really tempting So yeah, do check out the FPL Wire, um which is obviously Prize's podcast along with Late Riser and Zofar, which is obviously excellent and has a lot more in-depth strategy. Um Prize has written an article on the website as well which you can check out um as part of the premium membership which is currently 40% off with the link in the description uh, and you get the fixture ticker amongst other things um like you've seen on the screen. So Prize, thank you very much. Uh happy tinkering uh, and thanks <laughs> and again. And to you. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Take care. Cheers, guys.